All right, let's start with a word of prayer and get into our study tonight. Thank you for your time. Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to assemble together on a Tuesday night or Tuesday morning, depending on where we're located or if we're following YouTube via YouTube or any of the recordings. I trust that this will be uh, edifying to the, hear, the ears of those who are going to hear this. We pray now, Father, that, uh, that as we engage in your word, that God the Holy Spirit will take over and influence us in a, in a way that would be consistent with doctrine. But before we look into your word, we'll just pause for a moment of silence and name any sins if we have any. The scripture does say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as such, we'll just pause for a moment of silence so that we can utilize 1 John 1, 9, and then I'll open with prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for this golden opportunity for us as believers in Christ to assemble around your word. We know that there's so much going on around the world, and we've been saying this for the last several months now, and it continues to ramp up. So I pray that as we turn the pages of Scripture and listen to your word. I'm confident, Lord, that you will encourage us and empower us for service as we trust in you and you alone. You alone are worthy. You alone are, are worthy of our trust, our love, our allegiance. And so we ask all of these things in Christ's matchless name in which we pray. Amen. All right. Looks like someone is trying to call me here. I apologize for the ringing here. That's what happens when you have a cell phone, I guess. So, let's look at the passage of Scripture for starters. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at 10 through, we're going to go all the way down to 17. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, and perseverance, or that word is, has the idea of endurance. You've seen my persecutions, my afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. And out of them all, notice what it says here, the Lord delivered me. So he's schooling and teaching Timothy, Paul is. He's telling Timothy, look at what you have done, and I want you to continue to care. You have carefully followed my doctrine, verse 10, my manner of life. So he was paying attention to Paul's life, Paul's purpose, Paul's faith and confidence in God, Paul's um, long-suffering that he demonstrated numerous times in, in the face of adversity and dealing with uh, relationships. He saw his love. He saw how Paul endured. He saw the persecutions, afflictions, which had happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, I bared. And out of them all, all 10 of them, or 20 of them, whatever it was, the Lord delivered me. Isn't that encouraging? It's nice to know that someone like Paul, who is the author of 13 books of the Bible, went through all this and as he's mentoring Timothy he says look out of all the stress all the problems I've gone through it was the Lord who delivered me so persevere hang on there just follow my lead you followed my doctrine manner of life purpose faith long suffering and he's saying good job keep going and we're gonna see in the next several verses yes he reminds him at the end, verse 12, I'm sorry for the highlighting, but I, I highlighted it for a specific reason. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer persecution. So this kind of reminds us that as we engage in the things of God, as we get into the Bible classes, as we study his word, we can expect persecution. And oh boy, are we living in the times like now where we're going to be persecuted because of our faith, because we use the word Jesus, because we're found praying. All of that is what Paul was saying to Timothy. And he 
he kind of adds more. Now you'll notice on the right side, I put work, okay? So from verses 10 to 12, it's the idea of Paul's work, and as he's talking to Timothy. So if you have your Bible, and if you like to write notes, this is what my Bible says. I just put it here because I took a snapshot image of the Bible app that I have so that I can show the verses as we study. But from verses 10 to 12, in my Bible, I put work. From 10 to 12, Paul is addressing his work. You have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, all the work that Paul was displaying or describing to Timothy, it's all found in 10 through 12. And he concludes by saying, yes, all who desire to live godly, like you, Timothy, in Christ will suffer persecution. So I, I think that preposition in is very important, in Christ, in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So if you're not suffering, then you might not be living a godly life impacting others. So that's verse 12. And I now want us to take us over to the next W word, 13 to 17. And on the right side, notice I had written the word word, because now he's going to describe his word, the word of God. So please notice in verse 13, I'm going to read it, take it down all the way to 17. Paul speaking to Timothy, but evil men and imposters will grow better, right? No, it says we'll grow worse and worse. It's going to progressively get worse and worse. And what are they going to do? They're going to deceive and they themselves are going to be deceived. So there's something going on here. The evil men and the, the imposters are going to grow worse and worse. It's not going to improve. So what does that mean? We have to remain steadfast in the word. Because as Paul is describing this to Timothy, in turn, Timothy has uh, written this and recorded this, or Paul has, I'm sorry, and it, it has been recorded for our edification so that we can know that those, those of us who are willing to live godly lives in Christ can expect persecution. And also, God's word is telling us, but the evil men around us, are, and imposters are going to get worse and worse. It's not going to improve, not the way that things are. It's not going to get them better. It's going to get worse and worse. They're going to keep deceiving, and they themselves are going to be deceived. You see that? But you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from which whom you have learned them from. So I want us I want me to I want us to look at this word continue. I looked this up here I wanted to confirm uh, my sense was yeah it was it was in the it's called the present active imperative of the Greek verb meno. Again it is the present active imperative that word continue. You see this here I don't know if you can see my mouse but um, the word continue, present tense, it's the an ongoing action, continue to continue in the things which you all have learned and have been assured of, totally confident in, knowing from whom you have learned them. And of course, Timothy, uh, Paul is referring to those who taught him when he was younger. You see this in verse 15, from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures. So it, my point is, look at what I said, what I recorded on the right side. What I wrote down was word. The important thing I want you to see is, you must continue, keep continuing in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. In this sense here, it would be me, and anybody else who has been training you and teaching you in the Word of God, anything that was sound theologically, biblically, doctrinally, remember and keep those things in the back of your mind. Continue in those which you have learned. And 15 says, 
that from childhood, Timothy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. You'll notice that I put P1 to P3. P1 or P stands for phase one. There's phase one, phase two, phase three. So from phase one to phase three, the scriptures will make you wise for salvation. And I include all three, phase one, two, and three. Phase one is you've been justified and declared righteous before God, and you've been saved from what? The penalty of sin. Phase two is you have been saved from the power of sin. Phase three is you've been saved from the presence of sin. So all three phases, one, two, and three, delivers you from all sin. Penalty, power, presence. It climaxes at the end where we are ultimately face to face with God. This is why it is important because when you get to verses like this, you sit here and say, what do you mean wise for salvation? You mean being born again? That's just one component of the word salvation. And what does salvation mean anyways? Because if you have a knee-jerk reaction and say, oh, being born again? Oh, yeah, I'm born again. It doesn't mean that. It has the whole package. Wise for deliverance. When it, and when you see it like this, when Paul is uh, talking to Timothy or any of his other uh, younger folks that he's mentoring, it's usually in the context of all three aspects of salvation. And really, it has the idea of deliverance. And you have to frame it in a context. So when he says it's able to make you wise for deliverance through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, that encompasses phase one, phase two, and phase three, from faith to faith. You start with Christ from by faith, and you conclude by faith. So it's important to see this and kind of pull it all together so that it will start to make better sense. Then he goes on to say, again, keeping with the word on the right, word, all scripture, the word of God, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness. So this is rich with doctrine. It's rich with instructions and principles. And it tells us from verse 13, you know, it's going to get worse. So the only way that you're going to safeguard your spirituality, your spiritual life, who you are in Christ, is to recognize 13 to 17. It's going to get worse. It's going to grow worse and worse, being deceived and deceiving and being deceived. So even those who are deceiving us or attempting to deceive us is being deceived themselves. So it's getting worse and worse and worse. Isn't that what we're seeing today? You must continue in the things which you have learned, have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. So if, if you're learning this from me, then you have to continue. And this is what I've been challenging you all with, is continue in the Word of God with me, share the Word of God, repetition, repetition, repetition. It doesn't get old. It may seem like it gets old, but it's actually good for the soul the soul of your new man so that you can store it up so when you need it it's ready to draw the trigger when you need it when the hardship comes along the godliness that we saw in verse 12 those who live a godly life in Christ will can expect to suffer persecution so then he spills over to 13 to 17 you must continue in the word the things that you've learned knowing from whom you've learned them and from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Again, it's the Word that is able to make you what? Wise for deliverance. All three aspects, one, two, and three. Phase one, you don't have to worry about anymore because you're saved. Once saved, always saved. You don't have to worry at all. Once you're saved and born again, that's a done deal. You are sealed to the day of Christ Jesus. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Well, but Pastor Fred, you don't know my past. I don't need to know your past. You need to know your future in Christ. If Christ paid for your sins, past, present, and future, you don't have to worry about it at all because there's nothing that can outdo the grace of God. You know, we all have a past. We all fall short. Even today, tomorrow, next year, we're going to fall short. But all of that has been paid for 
by the blood of Christ, by the life of Christ. We don't have to sweat it anymore. And I believe that sometimes because of our past, sometimes our present, and even in our future, we, we kind of sulk and we say, well, God can't use me because I'm just a terrible turd. And I just, he won't love me because I keep confessing the same thing over and over. He loves you just the way that you are, plus some, more than anybody else can. He is your creator, he's your heavenly father, and you can take that to the bank. I say this because sometimes the reason why a person is in bold living for Christ is because they have a, a past that they can't get over. So they might be saying, you know, well, you know, I'm just, when I was in high school, I was like this, I did drugs, I did that, I slept around. You know what? God has already recognized that because he's sovereign. He knew all things in your past, present and future. And he has said grace. You're still graced out. There's nothing that can supersede the grace of God. So be grateful. Rather than sulking in the past, ramp up for the future. Go and advance the cause of Christ. Live for him and store up the rewards because he's wanting you and I to get out there and be busy for Christ. And when we do, he's going to reward us. I believe most of our rewards are going to be in, in eternity future, but I do believe that some of this some of the rewards will be present in this side of on this side of eternity because there are certain conditions that I can clearly see in the Bible where they're definitely for now. Like take for example a popular verse, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. Well, that's going to take place today or this on this side of eternity because if you're going through hardship of any kind, then love God. If you love me, obey me, John 14, 15. So God will cause all things to work together for good to those who love him. So if you're concerned about what's going on in your life, well, prioritize God. Put him first and leave the uh, results to him. Because he knows how to take care of that. And he knows how you were before. And he do, it doesn't even phase him. It's like watching a movie. You watch a movie and you say, Oh, I know what's going to happen because I saw this already. Well, similar to that, but probably not even close. God knows our past, present, and future. And he says, Grace, grace, grace. And the moment we place our faith in him, phase one, done. We don't have to worry about going through there again and then, and again and again and again. I mean, I remember in the Philippines when I was doing an HBI conference, some of the pastors there just are very reformed in their thinking and their theology. And they were trying to, it wasn't really a debate, but it was a, a lot of going back and forth. And you know what, Pastor? Uh, we don't agree with your your take on eternal security because if someone was driving down Tai Tai, you mean to tell me, if they smack into a, um, a jeepney and they, they didn't have a chance to repent, they're still safe? Yes. Well, how can you say that? Well, because everlasting life is everlasting life. When does everlasting life end? And they couldn't answer that. I said, because everlasting life doesn't have an end. And if God grants you that by faith alone in Christ alone, how can you even dare to say it will end? You know how many, you know what the problem there is? Now, you are challenging the omniscience of God. Because if he said he causes all things to work together for good, and if you place your faith in him, is he going to stand there and say, well, wait a minute, I didn't know you were going to be that bad, Freddie. I didn't know you were going to use 1 John 1, 9 10 times a day. I mean, now you're really pushing it. I don't, you know, we're, we're now going to challenge his omniscience. And that, there's a lot of things that is wrong with that. First of all, if you're born again, he has to unborn us. That's like having a spiritual reverse abortion. And that wouldn't look good on God. So there's so many problems with having to undo what he's given. It's, if he says it's a gift and he retracts and takes it back, now it's no longer a gift. It's something that needs to be merited. And so there's so many complications with saying, well, I've been a bad person. We all have. We have all fall short the glory of God. And I tell you, with my years of training, I can say with utmost confidence that God loves you in spite of your shortcomings. He loves us all in spite of our shortcomings. That's the grace of God. True, we may not be able to understand it, but you know what? 
That's the grace of God. Just, just like when uh, Dobson, I think someone called in and, and James Dobson, he was very popular in the 80s and 90s. I, I don't know if he's still around, Focus on the Family. I don't know if he led Jeffrey Dahmer or someone led Jeffrey Dahmer. They, you guys heard of Jeffrey Dahmer? Jeffrey Dahmer in the 60s or 70s was a man who would eat people. He would literally um, capture these people and eat them. He would, he would um, rape the men and break their body parts into small pieces and um, consume the bodies, I, I believe. This is a while back. But my point is, is that someone asked, called in and said, uh, Dr. Dobson, do you think Jeffrey Dahmer is in heaven? Oh yes, he is because he, he's placed his faith in Jesus Christ. So. Of course he's in heaven. If he genuinely places faith in Jesus Christ, and in spite of all the evil that he's done, yes. And a lot of Christians were calling in upset. They said, that's not fair. That's not right. How could he eat people and God will forgive him? And I don't know exactly the words and the amount of time they had to answer that, but he had a lot of pressure and backlash because Christians were irate. And I would stand with him and say, no, if God... If Jesus, if he, he acquiesced to Jesus Christ and placed his faith in Christ by believing in him, yeah, he's saved. So that I, I bring that up not to gross you out, but to show you, yes, no matter how bad your past was, God has cleaned, he's cleaned the slate. So having no, now that you know that, doesn't it make sense to now run hard for Jesus? Does it make sense to at least, because of his grace, bestowed upon you and me doesn't it make sense to live for him I mean that's the whole message of Christ that's the whole message of the cross he who believes in me has everlasting life and so a lot of this is like a broken record but I can't help but champion all of this because that's what I stand for and I hope you do too because we're trying to we should be all trying to get the word out there and extend the grace because how many people are stuck in this rut, they said, well, I can't believe in God because he hates me. I'm a transgender, so therefore I'm going to hell. I'm gay because I, and beca as such, I'm going to hell, obviously, because the person down the street said, turn or burn. So all people have the opportunity to be saved. It doesn't matter what their sexual orientation, it doesn't matter what their sin is. And we have to extend the grace of God to people. This is why I'm sharing these truths from the scripture here and the doctrines that we're studying together. Because I want you all to be so confident in what God's word says so that if we're not together, we can stand on our own and impact the people around us and tell them about the grace of God. Because yes, he will forgive all people. He has paid the price. The doctrine of propitiation. He has satisfied the wrath of God once and for all. For the world and for you and me. It's all done. Tab has been paid. We don't have to pay anything. We don't have to do anything. We don't even have to be good. Because we are not good enough. Now I'm talking about phase one now. P1 on the, in the middle there. P1. It's not about our efforts. It's not about being good. It's about placing our faith in someone who is superior, who is perfect. Not good, but perfect. In fact, Jesus said there's only one good, and it's God. So, let me run this down one more time. And verse 15, you, and that from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures. That's my goal. That's our objective, to know the Holy Scriptures, which is able to make you wise or smart, for deliverance through faith which is in Christ Jesus. What deliverance? Deliver, deliverance from phase one, two, and three. We've been saved, phase one, saved, phase two, fa saved, phase three. I've given you a chart several months ago. We covered salvation. So this is just review, right? So all scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is God breathing out. He orchestrated all of the, all of the letters of the Bible so that we would have a pure, unadulterated scripture in the original text, original um, language though, that's the problem. The translations like the New King James, they're not perfect. 
there's flaws, there are errors. King James back in 1611 said, thou shalt kill. That's not a good translation. 1611 said, thou shalt kill. Imagine if I taught that you're supposed to go kill people. You don't want that kind of a translation. Only the original autographs, the original Hebrew, he, original Greek text, those are flawless. They are without error. However, the translations that we have today are pretty accurate. They're pretty accurate. The translation committees of the New King James, New American Standard, ESV, are pretty consistent. They're evangelical. A lot of the translations that we're using today are pretty sound. However, I like to go and check out in detail certain words so that I can unpack even greater detail. It's kind of like the word continue in verse 14. That word is meno, similar to the word in John 15, I believe, where he says, Abide in me, and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. So he's basically saying, Meno, stay in the things that you have learned. Remain in the things you have learned. And that, again, is present active imperative, present tense. Keep on staying in the things that you have learned. And because it's the active voice, that means the subject produces the action of the verb. That's you, me, and all those who are believers. And it's in, a, in, in the imperative mood, that means it's not optional. So when Paul says continue, he's not saying, look, if you feel like it, continue. No, he's saying, look, you will, you must continue. Keep on, keep on, keep on continuing on the things that you have learned. Don't let off, don't back off, don't come up with excuses and say, well, I'm feeling sleepy today, I have a tummy ache. Well, you can have a tummy ache, but come back and continue, continue, continue the things that you've learned, knowing from whom you've learned them. And know this, all of Scripture is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that what? The man or the woman of God may be complete. That word is to, has the sense of being mature, thoroughly equipped for what? Every good work every good work. So let me just uh, go back and forth on the slide again, then we'll go to the study. So notice on the right side of this slide, word, right? So from 13 to 17, I have this block in my Bible that says word. When you go to 10 to 12, it's work. So Paul highlights the work in 10 to 12. Followed my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, long-suffering, love, and perseverance. You know about my persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, at Lystra. The persecutions I endured, and out of them all, guess what? The Lord delivered me. The Lord delivered me. And by the way, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Are you suffering persecution? Well, if it's suffering persecution because you made a d bad decision, that's your fault. We sometimes make bad decisions, right? We, we use our money unwisely. We spend it on things we shouldn't be spending it on. That's not on God. That's not God's fault. That's our fault, right? But if it's verse 12, if you're living, if you're designed to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. Now, what's interesting here, it doesn't say from who. It just says all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. Well, obviously from 10 to, 10 to 12, he talks about his work outside in specific locations, Iconium, Lystra, and so on. And the Lord delivered me out of all of them. But keep on following my doctrine, follow my life, my purpose, my faith, and he says at the tail end, anyone who desires to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. So I would even say this includes family. This includes friends, close friends. Because when, when you're desiring to live godly, there's something about you representing God, something about you standing for God that will cause tension. Isn't that true? Your friends and family know that you're going to church you don't want to go golfing with me? I mean, this is the only time I can go. Let's go golfing. Let's go out for, to Disneyland because we're, we can get in. The lines are short these days, so let's go to Disneyland. And wouldn't it be fun? And so when you desire to live godly in Christ, 
you will suffer persecution. So they're going to bag on you and rag on you for all of these decisions as you place God first. How do we know we're putting God first? Well, Paul says, you've carefully followed my doctrine. You followed my manner of life. You followed my purpose. You followed my faith, confidence in God, long suffering. You follow my love, my perseverance. So that is going to get a lot of tension, just that. In fact, 11 kind of details this. Persecutions, afflictions that happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, all these locations, Southern California, Northern California. Paul is saying, look, I went through some tough times. Yes, if you want to live a godly life, you'll suffer uh, persecution in Christ. So you got work and lastly, word. We saw this from 13 to 17. Pe evil people are going to get worse. Impostors will grow worse. Deceiving and being deceived. Please notice that. So it, it's very interesting that those who are deceiving, they themselves are going to be deceived. Why? So that there will be this ongoing vicious cycle. It's like it's going to fuel the aggression and the anger and bitterness. So as they're de deceiving people, they're going to be deceived so that they can continue to deceive. So please notice that the only way we're going to be able to remain uh, focused and stable is through the Word of God. Understanding the work of God, understanding the Word of God. You couple those together, you're steadfast in the work, steadfast in the Word, utmost confidence in Him, living for Christ, living for Him. And guess what hap what's going to happen? In the end, you will be a man or a woman of God. You'll be complete. You're going to grow in maturity. That isn't, remember what I've been saying? If you renew your mind in the things of God's Word, if you take the Word which is profitable for doctrine, reproof and correction, for instruction and righteousness, that the man, it's a generic term for man and woman, the man of God may be complete, the man or woman of God may be mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You don't have to go to some class and take this, go to Discipleship 101, or do this and do that and join this Bible study group to have a specific uh, uh, certificate you're going to earn. Because the scripture says, if you are going to get into doctrine in His Word, you find someone who's going to teach you properly, then the man of God may, the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped. Doesn't mean you'll know it all, but you're going to be ready. It's kind of like a car. You want a car that's equipped, fully equipped, right? That means it has power steering, power windows, uh, power brakes, air conditioning. If it's fully equipped, you're happy, right? You want a car that's fully equipped, RV that's fully equipped. The scripture is going to fully equip you, making you mature and preparing you for every good work. And so when you're involved with ministry, or maybe you're not involved with ministry yet, well, take in the Word of God, take in doctrine on a consistent basis so that you may be complete, mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. What an awesome passage to really reflect on before we get into our Word. So hopefully, if you have questions, save it for afterwards because I want to get into our study now. We only have two and a half hours left. Just kidding. So now we ended on page 34. And again, let's go through this so we have the flow of the author's thought. Pastor Gene, number two, stand firm in the faith. The present imperative form of the verb histomy was the battle cry of the elite Roman soldier. It meant to hold your ground in the face of enemy assault. Paul uses this word four times in Ephesians 6 10 through 14. The Christian soldier, that's you and me, the Christian soldier is enabled to stand firm by means of what? Our good looks, all the Bibles we have in our, in our truck, in our car, in our shelf? No, it's the ability to stand firm by means of faith in the unchanging Word of God. It never changes. It's stable, it's consistent, true and true, through and through. By means of the unchanging <coughs> Word of God, our feet, are, our feet are planted on the foundation of the promises 
of God. Hebrews 6, 17, 20. When we, put, when we have put on the full armor of God, find this in Ephesians 6, 14 to 18, through Bible study, the belt, spirituality and sanctification, the breastplate, personal witness, the sandals, daily trust, the shield of faith, eternal assurance, which is the helmet, application of God's word to life, the sword, and prayer, logistical supply, we can then stand firm. Because we're in a war, and our war is not with flesh and blood. So if we're at a war, and you don't know that, you're, you're probably getting clobbered. And you may, not, you may not have cuts or bruises on your skin, but if you're in turmoil, and you're bitter, and you're angry, there's a spiritual warfare going on. And this is why we're told to put on the full armor of God. I'm not talking about actual armor, but these armor, the, these uh, components, if you'll notice, like what the author says here, the full armor of God in, consists of Bible study, the belt, spirituality, and sanctification, the breastplate, personal witness, the sandal, daily trust, the shield of faith, eternal assurance, the helmet, application of God's word, the sword, and prayer, logistical supply, we can then stand firm. You know what I see in all of this, and I've taught this in the past, is that each of these represents doctrine. Doctrine. So if you comb through it slowly but surely, you'll, you'll get a sense that these are all related to specific doctrines. So act like men, point number three, or number three, the word andrizo, mean, andrizo means to be manly or courageous. In ancient Rome, the first of the virtues taught and admired was courage in battle. By the way, this word andrizo does not appear in the New Testament, but it does, it does appear in ancient Greek literature. So it's not something you're going to be able to search for in the New Testament. It's not there. So it's in the Greek, ancient Greek literature. And so, um, this idea of act like men, man up, be courageous. And the author says, in ancient Rome, the first of the virtues taught and admired was courage in battle. For the Christian soldier, courage in life comes from confidence in God and his plan. Knowing that God is in complete control, Romans 8.28, which is what we talked about earlier, gives us confidence and courage in facing and enduring trials and afflictions. So let me just say that again. I paused there because I was thinking of a, an illustration, but let me just say this again. Romans 8.28, it gives us confidence and courage in facing and enduring trials and afflictions. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom, top of 35, of God, Acts 14.22. I think I recall now the illustration. I, I've used this once or twice in the past. You see the confidence that comes with knowing that God is in complete control. I've used this in the past, and I don't know if you've heard me say this. I may have said this only in church. But having fear and worry is like, imagine if you will, you represent the Philippines, you represent America, or whatever you want to represent your country and you are an ice skater and you're on the Olympic team. And so you're up next. And they bring the score and they said, Freddie, you know what? Um, 10, 10, 10, Europe, China, Japan, they all have 10s and you're gonna have to uh, go out there and skate your best or whatever it is that I'm going to compete in. You have to give it your best because um, all the other countries have a high score and now it's your turn so give it your best Freddie so I'm going to be a little fearful I'm going to be a little timid I'm going to be a little nervous and so and that's normal that's to be expected right well think about what would happen and how the, how you would feel if your <clears throat> your coach comes and says Jasmine Freddie, Winston, uh, go out there and just give it your best. It turns out that um, USA is leading by 28 points. So even if you fall on your butt, we still win. We're going to take gold. 
So just go out there and relax because we're ahead. Yes, 10-10-10 was the last score, but when you tally everything up, it turns out that USA is far in advance or far ahead of the rest of the team. So go out there and give it your best. I just thought you would take that load off your chest. So go. Have fun. Would you not be relaxed and be a little bit more confident going out there knowing that we technically won already? Think about it. I know I would. If my coach came out and said, you know what, Freddie, we're, USA is already winning. So even if you blundered and you, took, you brought in a two or half of a one, we still win. We take gold. Because of all the other competitions, we've, we've went, we far exceeded everybody else. America, uh, Europe, Japan, China, we, we're still in advance. We're, we're still ahead of everybody. So just relax and go out there and give it your best. Wouldn't that make sense? I know I wouldn't be stressed out. And so what I'm saying is Romans 8.28, knowing that God is in complete control of your life and mine. Not that he controls us like a puppet but that he controls all things that happen around us so that even the adversary himself must get permission to, to distract us, to bother us, to attempt to oppress us. All of these things have to go through the hand and the finger of God. That's how much he loves us. He, nobody can touch us. A bullet can't touch us unless he permits it. That's how sovereign God is. That's the confidence we can have in knowing that God is in complete control. Nothing happens in your life or my life unless God permits it. If a perfect God allows certain things to happen in our lives, then that means that there is a purpose behind all the things we don't like and appreciate at the moment. But don't think that God has abandoned you. Don't think that God has turned his back on you because the same God who looked at his son 2,000 years ago and, and was watching him as he was there on the cross, crying out to him, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was sitting there in the same place that he's looking at you and me when we go through hardship. People have said, where's God when this goes on in my life? I, I feel like he's not there, he abandoned me. No, he's the same place he was when his own son went on the cross for you and for me. He hasn't changed. So now when the author said, knowing that God is in complete control, and he is, I, it just brought to remembrance an illustration that when we know that God's taken care of all this, we don't have anything to sweat. We don't have anything to worry about. It all has to work through and sift through the omniscience of God, the sovereignty of God. He's in complete control, even when we don't think that He is. He is. It's just up to us to inculcate that, to learn it through the doctrines that we're studying, so that we can stand up to the things of the world. Because we are living in a broken world. Yes, there are going to be some things we don't like. Yes, we're going to be hit with the challenges of life because we're in a broken world. God already told us this, told us this. And also we just read together, did we not, that those who are going to live godly lives in him will suffer? Did we not read that? So it's not like we're oblivious. We're learning this. And as we're learning this, get what guess what? We can make adjustments in our lives. We can start off with prayer instead and get it, instead of getting mad at God, we can stop and say, "Okay, is God teaching me something?" My grace is sufficient. Power is perfected in what? Weakness. So guess what? I'm feeling weak right now. Well, that's the best place to experience the power of God. The grace of God is sufficient. In fact, we're told that His power is perfected in my weakness and your weakness. It doesn't get any better than that. That's doctrine stored up as we inculcate it on a regular basis. We're renewing our mind and it's transforming our lives. And when, then we couple that with Romans 8, 28, recognizing that God is in complete control. You have no reason to worry. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything with prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. And then the consequence of that is the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through who? 
Christ Jesus. So we have no reason to worry. <clears throat> so, that's the illustration. So, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14, 22. But, by steady spiritual growth, we are able to attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.13 so again, the author is saying what I've been saying the past several weeks, but a steady spiritual growth. We're able to attain the unity of the faith, for the steady spiritual growth. And I've been amplifying and emphasizing that when we continue with a consistent, steady growth, the, the ongoing sin nature starts to diminish over time. The frequency and the tension diminishes over time as we grow spiritually. That's my angle. I've been saying that if you're struggling with something, we have to grow spiritually. We have to advance in doctrine on a consistent basis so that we grow. And as we grow, we, our sinful tendency starts to lose the intensity and the frequency starts to diminish as we grow in the image of Christ. So as we're growing into the image of Christ, we therefore have less tendencies or the tension and the frequency starts to slow down a bit it doesn't get it's not fully eradicated but as we're growing into the likeness of Christ we're starting to be more like Christ and therefore we're sinning less and less and less so we're not as inclined to um, exhibit the sin nature because we're exhibiting more of Christ Christ in me the hope of glory it's now coming out because I'm becoming more like Christ over time. As we mature, that's not going to happen if we don't mature. That's not going to happen if we don't inculcate Bible doctrine. That's not going to mature unless we study the Word of God. So number four, be strong. Strength in the spiritual life comes from three sources. First, from the control of the Holy Spirit or the influence of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. Second, from the Word of God. So you've got the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. And finally, from genuine spiritual growth or edification. Ephesians 6.10, 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 2. And as we combine these elements in our life, the three, the triune, the trinity of the three, being strong in the Holy Spirit, being strong in the Word of God, growing from spiritual growth and edification as we combine these three elements in our life we display a spiritual power not of this earth nor of ourselves it can't be ourselves there's no way we needed to get a helper jesus said i must leave it's to your advantage that i leave that i might be able to send you a helper so as second timothy 1 7 says for god has not given us a spirit of timidity but of power, love, and discipline, or a sound mind. So that's important to see. The spirit he gave you and me is one of power, love, and discipline, not timidity. The only reason why we would be, we would be timid and, oh, I can't speak, I don't want to share because uh, I'm, not, I'm not knowledgeable. You don't have to be knowledgeable. You just have to know the knowledge of what it is you have to share. You have enough to know what it takes to be saved. A lot of people don't. So you have enough to get someone to pass from death into life, to see someone come from the lake of fire to heaven in the glory and the presence of Christ by sharing the gospel. For God so loved you, Freddie, that he gave his only begotten son, that if you would believe in him, you would not perish, but you would have everlasting life. And if you know that verse like the back of your hand, you can say it with utmost confidence and you can pray before you share it and say, Lord, help me say it in such a way that they would be able to understand it. Help me rephrase it and restate it so that they would get it. Freddie, did you know that if you just believe in Jesus, you can have life everlasting? Have you ever wished you could have a mansion? You know, Christ promised his disciples, "Don't let not your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house are many mansions and I'm going to pray prepare a place for you and guess what you can have one too by just simply believing in Christ would you like a pension 
strike up a conversation like that and just see what they would say. You'll never know what Freddie would say. Talk to me. Ask me. Share the gospel to me. So be strong. Number five, let all be done in love. That's a very key component. Divine love is the greatest virtue and strength. Strength. It is the source of our salvation. John 3.16, I just said that moments ago. Ephesians 2, 4 to 7. The stimulus for service. See, we need to be doing service for God in the spirit of love, in the power of love. The author says divine love is the greatest virtue and the greatest strength. I added the greatest, but it's really strength and virtue that comes ultimately from God. Why? Because he himself is love and he exhibited all of this by his lifestyle. And if we think we can do it any other way, we're bypassing God the Son. We can't improve upon him. And if he lived it and he wants us to, to reflect that as light into a world that's pitched in darkness, it would be to our advantage to share this and live it out. It needs to be done in love, greatest virtue and strength. It's the source of our salvation, the stimulus for service, the pinnacle of growth, love, and the greatest witness, John 13, 34 to 35. They will know that you are my disciples by your love for what? One another. So that is very, very important. Love overcomes all things. So when you are exhibiting and, and living out love in your own personal life, among the brethren like what we have here, then you are reflecting God in you. It's not easy to do, but it is doable. Remember, there's a difference between hard and impossible. Hard is hard, impossible is impossible. It can't be done. Hard can be done under the influence of God, the Holy Spirit. Impossible can't be done. You can't scale the side of a building. That's impossible. But you can love me if I'm not lovable. You can love me. It might be hard, but it's not impossible. How can you execute that? Well, first of all, you have to be in 1 John 1, 9. You have to execute 1 John 1, 9. Be under the filling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And once you are, then try to love me. Then try to ignore my flaws and my shortcomings and say, Lord, this guy talks a lot. And I just, I get tired of hearing him talk and talk and talk. He's so, he just always doctrine, 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 always the word of God. He, is there anything else he can talk about aside from doctrine and the Bible and getting me to share my faith? Is there any, you know, you said to love the brethren. I'm going to love him because you commanded me to love. And so if I don't love, then I'm failing you, Lord, and I don't want to fail you. You never failed me, so it wouldn't be fair for me to fail you. And although he never expects us to be perfect, he wants us to strive. And so the imperatives throughout the scripture apexes and pulls it all together, and we ought to do things in love. We ought to care for one another because that is a display of God working in us and through us. And if we try to circumvent that, we set ourselves up for discipline. We should never, never do that. So now, um, that's number five. Five factors of effective faith. We still have about six minutes, so let me take this down to six minutes here, or yeah, see if I can finish this in six minutes. Number one, five factors of effective faith, taken from Daniel 11, 32, 32 to 35. One, effective faith is built on genuine knowledge of God. So you can't have effective faith. You can't even have faith in God without knowing God. You can't do it. You can't try to have confidence in God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So the author is clear. Effective faith is built on genuine knowledge of God. This means knowing God, not just knowing about him. We come to know him as creator through his creation, Romans 1, 18 to 21. He reveals himself to us through his word. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, and we come to know him in a personal way through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, Philippians 3, 7-14. So, genuine knowledge of God, not just certain facts about God. He was God the Son. He was here 2,000 years ago. That's, that's important, but that, there's more to it than just knowing facts about him. You must know him on an intimate level. And the way that you're going to be able to accomplish that is through the filling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, and 
making sure you you prioritize him you carve time out to get to know him right now we have uh, two studies during the week so if you double dip Tuesday and Wednesday you're getting more doctrine than the average person who's only going once some of you some go once Tuesdays and some go Wednesday only and I'm not saying you have to I would never say you must but if you are interested in accelerating your growth it only it's only going to come through a consistent consistency in Bible doctrine which is what we're currently doing you're getting the word in the front in the up uh, up front and then the doctrine in the after the word so it's a combination of the two we're getting the word of God observing the text and then flowing through key doctrines and when you have that sandwich together you're getting a uh, double dose of God's spiritual word and uh, you can't improve upon that plus you add the third study on Sunday afternoons with us you're getting three times a week which is pretty decent um, so anyways this means knowing God not just knowing about him number two effective faith is a spiritual power at work this is the power that I've been saying in phase two salvation throughout the year we need more of that spiritual power. So listen to what the author says here. James says that faith, or I'll say doctrine, without works is dead or useless. James 2.17 and James 2.26. Faith takes the power of God's spirit, Galatians 5.22 to 23, and word, Hebrews 4.12, you take his word. Hebrews 4, the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, that's Hebrews 4.12. And puts it to work in life. Utilize it. Use it in life so that you can exhale. You inhale by taking the word. You exhale by application of the word. And puts it to work in life. Matthew 5.13-16. Ephesians 2.10. Power is the characteristic of the growing Christian. Ephesians 1.18-19. Ephesians 3.14-19. Colossians 1.24-29. 2 Peter 1-5-7. And then number three, <clears throat> effective faith turns personal faith into public ministry. So now you're taking the faith that you have exhaled, the faith that you're stewarding and growing, because that's number two. Uh, faith without works is dead. When you look at, if someone comes to you and says, um, I, I need, I'm in need of food and clothes, and you say, be warm and be merry, and you do nothing with it, that faith can't save, that faith can't deliver. So... I would reword faith here to mean, to mean doctrine. Doctrine without works is dead. So it's like saying, you know, you have all this doctrine, you got all these notes that you're taking, but yet when you need to apply it to someone's life or your life, you don't even use it. It's dead or useless. It's like a car that is sitting in your, your driveway. If the battery is dead, you can't use it, right? It's no good for nothing. You, can't, you, can, you have a Rolls Royce, you're parked in the front, but you're saying, hey, Freddie, that's a nice car. Yeah, I know. It's a Rolls. It's a Bentley. Uh, can we take a spin? Uh, battery's dead. What good is it to have a Bentley or a Rolls Royce in your front yard and you can't turn it on? It's dead. The battery's dead. Is it still real? Yes. But it's just dead, so therefore it's useless. Faith or doctrine without works is dead. Useless. So that's the idea coming from James. Number three. Effective faith turns personal faith into public ministry. That is key. Nice way to uh, conclude number one, two, and three. Effective faith turns your personal faith into public ministry. Every believer in Jesus Christ is an ambassador of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 21. A priest of God, 1 Peter 2, 5 to 9. And a minister to other believers. What? Yep, you're supposed to minister to me. I'm supposed to minister to you. By sharing and by congregating together like this, and I know it's we're used to being together in a building, but you know, as we're congregating like this, this is a new way of having fellowship these days. It's apparently God is allowing us to use it like this because of all these things that are going on, pandemic and the like. We're able to sustain a study where we're learning about Him. You're not learning about me. You're learning about him. 
And is God being honored? Yes, He is. We're growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And thus, when we grow, when we learn these things, can we turn out, can we go out and start to apply this in personal life? Of course you can. If not, I'm not going to do this. If you're just sitting here just because you like hearing me talk and talk and talk, it defeats the purpose. I'm here for those who are students of the Word, who wants to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, so they in turn can take this and advance it somewhere else. That's the whole purpose for why we do what we're doing. So now, number four, a couple, two more and then we're done. Effective faith will always result in persecution. We saw that earlier. In times of persecution, God gives the believer who is faithful a little help because a little help combined with effective faith is always, always enough. It only took David one stone and faith to slay Goliath. Because this world hates Jesus Christ, John 15, 18 to 24, it will also hate and persecute those who reflect him. Matthew 5, 10 to 12, 2 Timothy 3, 12. It is the highest honor a believer can attain to share in his master's sufferings. Philippians 1, 27 to 30, Colossians 1, 24, 1 Peter 4, 12 to 14. So number five, effective faith follows a path of continual refining and purifying. And I might add that the purifying and refining always comes as a result of persecution, trials, and challenges. It's the purifying fire that allows us to um, take off all the, the bad impurities in our lives so that we can in turn see it and make adjustments where necessary. Sometimes it's only through the challenges of life that we're able to see our shortcomings or our blind spots. So it's always a good thing to recognize that that sometimes will refine and cause us to exercise faith in Him and we'll be able to see this is why faith to faith, the principle of Romans 1.17 and Romans 4.18 compares this to a path of the growing light of dawn turning, turning to day. Cleansing is a major theme in salvation, Ephesians 5.26 John 13 10 spiritual growth first John 1 7 and in confession and correction so not just confession co correction we always say well as long as I confess my sins I'm okay true the feeling of the spirit is re return you're no longer grieving him but you have to make adjustments when needed so you <clears throat> you confess and correct first John 1 9 to second Timothy 2 19 to 22 David gives a beautiful picture of God's power and willingness to forgive and cleanse in Psalm 51. The path of correction is outlined in James 4, 6 through 10. So this is where we will stop on the bottom of page 37. And we'll resume this next week. I just want to end on time. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, you guys are all still here. Good. So let me um, open it up now. Does anybody have any thoughts, comments, or questions regarding this study? Just unmute your mic and let's see what we got. You guys like this thus far? Got some good stuff that we're covering here. So what do you think? Anybody? Thoughts, comments? Does this cause anybody to say, oh, I can identify with that? Just unmute your mic because if you're talking, I don't hear you. It's very comprehensive. <laughs> a lot of information. Yes, it is. There's a lot of information. So if I, I guess I need to slow down a little bit because I, when I add my stuff on it, it just makes it even more, I th would think. So I apologize that sometimes I just keep talking and going and going. I piggyback on what Pastor Gene says. But because there's so much there that I want to make sure that we're getting what he's saying plus what I think God is wanting me to communicate at the moment. So the information itself is a good read and a good study. But sometimes as we're going, I'll, I'll sit there and insert something that I think would be appropriate to what he communicated. So you're right, Karen. What you add is helpful. Oh, thank, thank you. you. I, I try, I, I, I take the material, whatever it is, and look at it and as we're going through, I'll, I'll, rem I'll remember certain things that I've uh, 
studied and I'll insert that and I know sometimes it delays our time and I don't try to drag it out I just try to make sure it's worth your all of your time so that when you commit to the hour with me then I want it I want you to walk away and say well that was something I needed to hear or something I've never heard before or something I needed to hear again because I, I value your time and I don't purposely try to make it longer than it sometimes is but I want you to be fed spiritually I, I, you guys are spending your time with me so I want you to say well that was worth my time if I'm going to commit to Tuesday nights Tuesday mornings Wednesday night Wednesday morning depending on where you are I would want you to walk away with something and say well that was refreshing I needed to hear that or I've never heard that before or I, I heard him say that but this time around it it hit me a slightly hit me slightly differently the second third time I heard him say that now it it's starting to pop for some reason maybe the Holy Spirit is wanting me to hear this for something that's around the corner or I've heard people say that so I hope that's the case but uh, anybody hi Ruben hi Nanita again and Rudy Connie Rod um, Anybody have any thoughts, comments? Let me see. Okay, your, your, uh, the reading that a, when you explain it thoroughly, uh -huh. now I can understand it and everything. Yeah. It's not like uh, some people just reading the verse. Mm -hmm. that, the added explanation that, that you guys you're doing is helping me a lot. Okay. Very good. I, I, I'm hoping it does. I don't, you know, I, I realize that sometimes when I go and explain and explain and explain, I realize we're going 15 minutes over, 10 minutes over, an hour over, 30 minutes over. And some of you have been so kind and say, say things like, well, we don't care if it goes over. But I, I try to be careful because some people on online is also working the following day so if I keep going over line, over the time then they may never come back and I don't want to ruin that either because they're they need to get up the following day and I can certainly say well what's what's a priority you know but I want to extend grace and re recognize that you know people have jobs that they have to hold down and they have to wake up the following morning and so I don't want this to be a burden I want it to be a fr breath of fresh air something that's going to encourage and empower them so that they'll want to come back and and so every every individual is different and uh, I try my best to strike a balance so that we get a good study and uh, being sensitive to everyone's schedule thank you, sir. thank you Rod I appreciate that anybody else have any thoughts or comments Pastor Freddy. Hi, Nanita. Hi. So, uh, thank you for the study tonight. Mm -hmm. um, like Karen said, it's very comprehensive mm -hmm. and a lot of information. So, anyways, uh, like what you said mm -hmm. in the first uh, study of the scriptures. Yes. Uh, it's hard to comprehend God's uh, ways. Like, He forgives even for the most uh, a person that has done uh, such a, a gravity of sin, thick gravity of sin. Right. Now, uh, he's a very forgiving God, but then if, if that person is a believer in God, mm -hmm. but he does things that, you know, he's, he continues to commit sin, then who then is this thing to go to hell if in that case if that person is continues to be committing um, sin? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would answer it like this, Ninita. Um, if the person genuinely has placed their faith in God, then they're genuinely saved. So if they continue to live in sin, then I would think because of that relationship, God the Father would treat the son or the daughter 
in a way that would be consistent with his character. So he would step in and in time discipline him or in time discipline her. And how that looks, it's different and unique for each child. So it's not going to last forever. God has a way with getting our attention. Sometimes it's an illness, sometimes he'll take them home early, but it would never result in hell or the lake of fire because that is now a, a son or a daughter of his. He would never send them to the eternal lake of fire because now they have realized in some time in their life that they need God, but now they're going AWOL and they're living contrary to God's will. And we, we know a lot of people like that, like the prodigal son. So that is like the thief on the cross, for example. He had no way of fixing his life. He, he only said at the last second, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. But he lived such a hideous life. We don't know too much except he was uh, bound for capital punishment. It cost him his life. Whatever the crime was, it was such that it, he was on the cross to die for all the grievous sins that he committed so he had no time to say sorry he had no time to get baptized he had no time to live a life of godliness or holiness so by, by on the the word of God Jesus said you will be with me so the thief there is a, a perfect example of the grace of God so even though he didn't get to rectify or fix anything, he didn't even get to live for Christ, Jesus said, today you will be with me. He knew he was going to die. Jesus knew they were both going to die. And he said, today you will be with me in paradise. So that's, that's assuring, especially when we have a loved one, a family member, a friend who continues to live in sin. But I, I can see all the passages that relate to grace. And I, I too have, have often said, how could he forgive that person? How, how could he do that when he lives like that? She lives like that. Grace. It's the concept of grace that we will never be able to fully understand. That's how much he loves us. I mean, are they living in sin? Yes. Maybe they are. God knows it too. Will God deal with them? Yes. Never in hell though. Not in the lake of fire. Because like I said earlier, he or she is now a child of God. And so he's not going to terminate that life. He's not going to say, you're no longer my son. You're no longer my daughter. Because he has to uphold his integrity. If that person has in, in the past placed their faith in God, then he can't undo that. He has to stand by his word. So when we are faithless, he remains faithful. But that's a very, very good uh, question, Anita. And so, um, you know, we did in the past, several months ago, cover uh, salvation. And so, but we will probably cover more of this um, tomorrow uh, because we're going we're gonna to review uh, the parts that I missed on uh, the pages of of our study and I'll probably cover more of the eternal security stuff just to be clear but you know to answer your question Anita will that person be saved even if they keep sinning and sinning and sinning the answer is yes 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 so we can't we might not forgive them if they wrong us and they keep wronging us we probably would say no forget you that's human nature that's not God's nature God's nature looks at us with grace. He looks at us through the righteousness has, that has been imputed to you and to me on the virtue of faith in Christ. So that's why it's not about how we live. It's about who we placed our faith in. Because the moment you place your faith in Christ, that righteousness, His perfect righteousness, envelops you. It's been credited to your account. So it's not about how, for example, if I, li, if I turn AWOL and I turn transgender or something, and I, hey guys, I have, I'm sporting a rainbow, I, hey, no matter how bad I turn, I'm still saved. But I'm not going to take advantage of that and say, you know what, I'm saved anyways, because God will deal with me. 
and he will deal with the people that you know, that I know, who continually reject God. But if you're asking me if the person who has placed their faith in Christ in the past somewhere, will they ever be met with the lake of fire and judge? No, the scripture says there's no, therefore there's no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So you might be thinking, yeah, but they're living in sin. God knows that. That's his specialty. His omniscience, his essence, uh, therefore recognizes their shortcomings, our shortcomings, and has said, yes, they're still my child. Can we handle that? A lot of times we can't, especially if it's a loved one. But can God handle it? He can handle anything, Danita. And I would just say this in closing. Whoever this person is, and it sounds like you're very concerned, and if it's a family member, which it might be, just know that God, if you're in pain, it pains God even more. Because he made the person. He made him, he made her. So it, it pains him more than you. Um, so can God handle that? Yes, he can. How? I don't know. I do know that God has his way of winning them back getting them back on track, nudging them in the right direction. He can orchestrate certain things in their life so that they'll have to realize that the only way that this can ever end is when they submit to God, when they get right with God. So I don't think that's far from happening. We just have to bombard it with much prayer. Prayer is still the best way to move the hand of God because He hears prayers. So if we hit it with a lot of prayer, locking shields, Nanita, God will hear our prayers. So I know this is heavy on your heart and it, it might disturb you and bother you. That's a, that says something about you, that you are a gracious person, that you care. That says a lot about you. That's commendable, that you would be con so concerned about this person, be it family or friend that you would even raise the question on their behalf. You're thinking about their eternal destiny and that's very commendable. I wish more people would think like that because that's what this study is all about. I'm always trying to find people who have these questions like, well, what if they are still like this? Well, that's what I'm trying to do with these studies, Nanita. Keep studying with me so that we can learn more about the grace of God, the Word of God, the transformative power of the Word of God, so that when we're stuck like this, we can have utmost confidence in Him because it doesn't depend on our feelings, how we feel about Him, how we feel about her. It's dependent on the veracity of the Word of God. That is why I have hope because the Word of God will always come to pass even when nothing else on, the, on this earth does. It never fades. It never will. And we can trust it. So you can trust God. He's going to take care of Him. He's going to take care of her. But your part now is to bombard it with much prayer. Go to God in much prayer. Lord, you know I opened this up, the Tuesday night study, and you know how I feel about this person. I'm, I'm going to be, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to be with much tenacity, pray on their behalf. And Lord, I just hope in, in the right time, you'd win her back, win him back to your, to your love. Extend grace to her as you have. Extend grace to him as you have. And I look forward to the day that they're no longer living in sin. And I believe God can answer those kind of prayers. That's part of God's will. His desire is that none should perish. So the fact that you're asking questions like this tells me that you're very concerned about this individual. So I, I think all of us will back you up in prayer. You don't have to specify anything. But we'll just amen together and lift this person up because you raised it, Nanita. That's part of being a family here in, in our Tuesday night study. That's the value of congregating like this so that when you're stuck on your own and you don't know who to turn to and where you're bogged down and you're just so heavy with all this stuff on your heart and on your mind, we can absorb that because when one rejoices, we can all rejoice. When one is, is um, not rejoicing, we suffer along with you too. So that's part of being a part of the family. So we'll pray with you, Nanita. But thank Amen. you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nanita, for being open. 
And I would have a comment in the chat. Oh, there is? Okay, I'm sorry. Let me see the comment on the chat. Okay. Gladys. Oh, thank you, Gladys. I like the author included the effective faith is built on genuine knowledge of God. That's right. And emphasizes not just knowing about him, but really getting to understand his intent of mind. This can only be done by digging deep in... Let me see. In... Why am I... In... Digging deep. You know, for some reason, there's a little icon that's covering. Can you read the rest, Karen? I got to the part where it says digging deep in the Word of God consistently. Yeah. Okay. Digging deep into the Word of God consistently because He is revealing Himself to us and instructing us what we should be doing daily. God's Word is our roadmap to daily living. So why not get to know God? his son personally amen to that thank you Gladys and you know I I'm not sure why but when I go in the chat box I click on the chat box on the bottom and it pulls it to the right side of the screen which is fine but then I have this little icon that just kind of it has like a emoji cons I guess they're called and it covers uh, certain words and so when I read all the way down it blocks the right side of my screen for some reason. I'll have to figure out. I'm going to take a picture of that so I can show some of you later on what it's doing on my side of things. But thank you, Gladys. I really appreciate that. And that's why I'm here. I want to do that and do exactly what you said here. We should continue to get to know him more and keep digging deeper. It doesn't get any better than that. So I appreciate that because that's so true we can't do it without digging deeper we can't do it without getting into sound bible teachers like this with good material and so if we're just um, shooting off the hip and just pulling anything from online we're not guaranteed we're getting anything that's sound doctrinally speaking sound scripturally speaking sound theologically speaking and if we're not getting anything sound then is it really honoring to god and if it's not why study it Right? We don't want to invest our time in something that's not honoring to God. We saw in the Old Testament that if you bring sacrifices to God that are not pure, then God will strike you down. So I wouldn't want to be stricken down. I wouldn't want any of you to be stricken down. So we must handle the Word of God carefully, and it has to be pure. It has to be the pure Word of God correctly uh, handled and correctly taught. Because if not then we are answerable to him. He's going to say, why did you bother with that? And I don't want to go down that path because there's so much good material out there. Well, not really, but there's good material out there that if we would just take the time and carefully study it, then that brings honor to God, that improves our spiritual maturity, that improves our spiritual growth, our spiritual advance. And in the end, we have something to steward. So God, the Holy Spirit, will bring to remembrance the things we have studied, the things that we've inculcated. But if we haven't studied, if we haven't inculcated it in our soul, he can't draw anything out. He's going to bring something to remembrance, but he won't put it in our minds. He'll help us remember the things that we've studied. But if we haven't studied, he can't bring it out. So we have to keep that in mind. So now I, I'm, I blew it again. We went over time. So, oh my gosh, I'm... And I can first John 1 9 this tonight. So, anyways, let's close in a word of prayer and I'll see you guys tomorrow, those of you who are a part of the Wednesday night as well. So, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you as always for allowing us to study your word. There's nothing more important for us as believers than to study your word. And so, I pray that as we continue to get into your word and inculcate it on a regular basis, that you would honor our efforts, transform our lives, and give us a spirit of boldness and confidence in your word. Your word says that um, as we take it in, you'll transform our lives, and I'm confident that that's what's happening now. 
So I pray for each person on the study that you would um, allow them to get good rest. And the things we've studied will be stored up in the, in the soul so that we can utilize it when necessary. Thank you for every person here. I pray that you would bless them in a very special way, keeping them safe so that they can return tomorrow, Sunday, or next week, whatever it is that your will would be for that person. Thank you so much for this time. We ask these things through Christ's name. Amen. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. Good night, everybody. If I can. Thank you. Thank you, Nanita. Bye-bye. Okay, good night. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Connie. Okay, good night.